This is part two of my conversation with Jack Salzman. For part one, please click the link in the description. Um, I don't know if you remember um, back November 2014 when CM Punk appeared on Hulk Cabana's Art Wrestling podcast, that big, you know, bombshell uh, episode where he talked all about uh, his departure from WWE um, right after the 2014 Rumble. It sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah. I'm, well, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was saying I think it's interesting, like just the overall history of those two. You know, they have so much history together, and I don't know if you remember, but it sounded like it hit like a major, like, you know, brick wall within the last couple of years. Because, like, for yeah. the two that everyone kind of kept saying were like, you know, super close buddies they ended up like really getting into this like nasty legal feud with each other that i think resulted in just like a settlement but like it was something that i feel like kind of came out of left field it was like punk and colt cabana these guys are literally like you know bread and butter like from like the old days and like just to think that those two would have any kind of bad blood to settle with each other is kind of amazing yeah and also both being from Chicago, but I think Cole Cabana is like, like hail from being from Maxwell street or something like that, you know, two good friends. And yeah, I've heard about that, you know, whole another settlements. I mean, as if punk wasn't going through enough, you know, lawsuits in the past, you know, in recent years, he also went through um, when Dr. Amon from WWE sued him for that, uh, that very episode of art of wrestling. Yeah, I think it's funny and is when I think of Punk and um, Colt Cabana because they both definitely like to market them as like, you know, Chicago based wrestlers, but I feel like they kind of fit in that hilarious thing. Are you actually from Chicago or are you from the (laughs) suburbs? And then you get, you know, Punk, oh, I'm actually originally from Lockport. And then you got Colt Cabana, well, you know, I grew up in Deerfield, but like, you know, that's close to Chicago, you know, so it's like. I always think that's always funny because it just reminds me of when I was in college, you know, just this heavy scrutiny of like telling somebody you're from Chicago. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Punk is, I, I'm like Punk, like grew up in Lockport. I think he actually lives in Des Plaines now. I also heard that he, uh, or either Des Plaines or that he lives in Wrigleyville or something like that. I'm really, I thought I found where that. he was or not like oh. actually found, but I thought I, I remember hearing somewhere that he had a super nice house, like above a tattoo parlor in Wicker Park. And I've seen that that tattoo place itself. And it's like so unassuming. You could can't really think like, wow, there's a huge apartment like above this. And that's where I had heard he and him and AJ were living, but I don't know if they mm-hmm. still are. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not really sure myself. Um, they make so many appearances at random things, though. You know, you, every once in a while you'll find them at a Cubs game or you'll find them, like, you know, just walking. But not yeah. very often. They seem very kind of reclusive and pretty try and shy away from the public eye. What I find funny, speaking of CM Punk and the Cubs, there was, um, I think it was the day that um, his his uh, case in, well, Dr. Ramon's case in court was, dismissed in the Cook County courts over uh, that our wrestling episode, the same day that his case was dismissed, a few hours later, he was at a Cubs game singing the seventh inning stretch, which I think is, which I find strangely right. funny. Just like, dude, you, you just got out of car and be like, only in Chicago would something like this happen. Exactly. Speaking of Cubs games and uh, wrestlers doing the seventh inning stretch, I went to one Cubs game few weeks ago and the first pitch and the seventh inning stretch was done by the big show now known as paul white yeah paul white i saw that that he uh his pitch i thought was was rather nice his singing was a three strike whiff but you know yeah that was rough that was very rough but it was cool to see him i guess that obviously i know this is your show but i'll ask you how do you feel about him being in AEW, did that kind of catch you by surprise at all? It caught me by a big surprise. I mean, uh, Big Show's been or Paul White, whatever. He's been in. Uh, uh, he's you know been wrestling for years. First as the Giant in WCW, then of course as Big Show. Uh, it's you know quite a surprise to me because I thought around this time he'd start you know wrapping up his career. I know that 
you know, some fans, you know, don't really like, you know, how he wrestles now, like, you know, with how, I mean, of course he's, you know, quite a big guy and stuff like that. But as he, you know, as the years pass by, uh, some fans have wanted him to retire, but I'm, you know, very happy to see that he's still doing fairly decent, fairly well in a yeah, yeah. trying to get at least a couple more years before he finally exactly. decides enough's like, enough. Yeah, it caught me by surprise too, because like even when I think part of the reason people probably wanted him out is because I think he'd been kind of under the radar for so long, but everyone kind of knew in the back of their mind that, you know, like he might not be on the actively performing, but he's, you know, him like Titus O'Neill, you know, they're big on the charitable side, you know, they're big philanthropic yeah. faces of the company. So I thought that was kind of a weird thing for him because like, this is a guy who, you know, when you think of the face of like, you know, most charitable publicity for all things wwe he's definitely one of the ones for it so to see him kind of do this little 180 and go to aw that was kind of an interesting surprise but i think also i think it was time for him to move on because i think a lot of people could tell it was hard for him to really fit in like he'd he'd make appearances but like obviously he's not actively involved in any storyline so it's like there's really no easy way to work it in yeah. Just somewhere that makes sense. Yeah, and by you know, I you know, I wish him the best with everything that he's you know, doing. I you know I'm happy for him. Uh how soon do you think it'll be before CM Punk and Brian Danielson gets title runs in AEW? I don't know. I feel like that, that's a good question. I'm not I'm not sure. I think I think it'll kind of I think it'll run its course a little bit. I think, you know, there's still, you know, a lot of momentum coming off their debuts, even though it's been a couple months already. But I think I think there's still plenty of time before that they'll really kind of gun for it. And I I obviously, you know, I'm sure they both want to have a couple championships under their belt before they fully hang up the boots. But I feel like, you know, there's so much young talent out there that I think. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're like if gunning for the, the belts is like kind of lower priority. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking that could like I was thinking originally that could be probably as soon as after the new year, but that might be cutting it a bit too close because there's so much talent in AEW right now. But my prediction is possibly after the new year to coincide with uh the road to WrestleMania, the Royal Rumble, Illumination Chamber, and the event itself, but we'll have to see. Yeah. Now, I was always curious because I, I don't watch the program nearly as much, but I know when WWE, when people debut on WWE after either being repackaged or like you know they're familiar in some degree, but like they kind of do this like you know nonsense like suspension of disbelief where like the announcers like seemingly oh i've never seen this guy before it's like yes you have like you know you can just kind of see through how ridiculous that is has aew done that at all like on the flip like or because i feel like wwe has a very strict like they don't try and mention the names of other promotions or if they do they'll just mention like international work um i don't think that uh aew has done something like that with you know the, the repackaging sort of thing um, and honestly, I don't think, and well, WWE has mentioned AEW a couple of times. I remember one time um, Sami Zayn was like kind of doing a, some sort of, you know, ask me anything audience questionnaire kind of thing. And he like really told somebody, he's like, that's what you're going to be asking me about? You can ask me about anything. You can even ask me about AEW. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm, I yeah, thought, oh, I wonder how much crap he got for saying that. I feel like that was a very li- slightly like, if he lying to say yeah i was you know i was actually a little nervous that sammy was about to like that is the those were the last words sammy ever said on wwe program i thought he was gonna yeah. get, get get the future endeavor like the next day yeah we have come to terms on the release of sammy's <laughs> oh lord which i wouldn't be too upset about i think he's kind of irritating yeah but he did hit the, that uh conspiracy theory storyline rather well recently because he was doing a uh conspiracy about how you know the company's keeping away from tiles or something like that 
you have to wonder if there's actually some substance to that too. But he, yeah. actually, he actually did a lot better than what our truth did back in, I don't know what year it was, like 2010, 2011, with uh, R Truth versus John Cena, him, you know, the whole thing with little Jimmy and all that stuff. Yeah, and I think R Truth is like what I consider WWE's comic relief. So I feel like trying to like sound convincing is hard, even though I think it's interesting and I don't think he's being underutilized, but he's one of the like the most he has a very decorated past like you know he was in the wwe under a different name you know back in the early 2000s as k quick k quick you know so i think it's interesting like and i don't know if like WWE's trying to like kind of like put that behind them or not whatnot but you would never expect when you see all these angles with our truth especially the whole 24 7 like championship thing oh boy (laughs) you would you would never think that this is a guy who's actually put on a lot more experience than he lets on yeah yeah he's yeah it's a really you know big change from what he's did in years past uh so with these two big debuts cm punk brian danielson what does this mean for wwe's future do you think that the company can rebound from this I think WWE, if they can get past this like kind of formulaic rut they're stuck in, yeah, I think they can really, you know, I think I think WWE needs to like maybe take a little bit of a step back and kind of allow give wrestlers this kind of breathing room to keep their wings going a little bit. And I think they create a good environment to allow people to kind of get their feet wet, but also with enough room to like move on and then prosper. Like, I feel like, I think, I feel like WWE is kind of like a big version of what NXT is trying to do. You know, like NXT is trying to bring up these young guys, like these new amateurs all together, but now WWE is trying to put them out there. But I think once they reach that point, then they can, you know, keep going. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking I really don't, I honestly really don't know. Part of me believes that WWE is almost too big to fail. Like it is like the, you know, the premier, you know, promotion when it comes to pro wrestling or Vince McMahon to call it sports entertainment. Same thing. <laughs> right. Uh, I think, but I think it's still, you know, it speaks to Vince's. I'm, I'm, I would, and not to get too cynical, but I would honestly wonder like how well can like Stephanie or Triple H really steer the, the product, you know, in the event that Vince, you know, either, you know, passes away or finally just says, you know what, to hell with it. I'll retire now. I've, I did everything I could, but, you know. Yeah. Part of me doesn't even want to, you know, think of, you know, WWE without Vince McMahon in the picture somehow, you know, whether he, you know, whether he retires or goes, but I'm thinking that, you know, considering, the amount of superstars that have been released lately from WWE. I know a lot of it was partially because of pandemic budget cuts and stuff. Also, um, recently, Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard, brother love for some of you fans, taking control of, actually took control of NXT from Triple H. Triple H made NXT like this, you know, really like brought it up from what was before this internet show reality series stuff that you know michael cole was clowning on a daily basis but only because he was uh was forced to be the announcer for it going from that to something that was really kind of cool but then there's also these rumors of them bring it back like bring it back down to what was before the whole reality concept um uh, most recently another thing that's you know making me iffy about wwe was um most recently at Extreme Rules, the end of the Roman Reigns versus Finn Balor match with the rope breaking. Such and a horrible all, ending. Yeah, a terrible ending, just with that with the rope breaking and Roman Reigns all of a sudden retaining the title. I'm just like, what? Just why? Why? Yeah, why did this have to happen? Yeah, and I think it's interesting, you know, Roman Reigns, the, the direction they're going with Roman Reigns is interesting because I, I kind of like what they're doing with Brock Lesnar. They're kind of like, you know, you don't see a face Brock Lesnar almost ever. So it's kind of cool to see 
him really kind of do it in a way that's interesting because you know he's like getting everyone all bent out of shape because he acts he's kind of like getting under Heyman's skin a little bit it's like oh you told me about this and then like yeah. Heyman has to answer for himself so I think it's interesting to like see he's kind of you know he's kind of got him by the finger a little bit also Paul Heyman's still working with Rowan Reigns so there's a bit of a a bit of a conflict there too yeah do you I I've been following this a little bit do you think I think it seems like WWE's going back to doing more gimmick based wrestlers again mm-hmm. I feel like you know and I think that's kind of interesting, except I feel like it's kind of taken the extreme turn where there's like ones that are just really out of left field, like especially the fact that they continued Alexa Bliss to kind of yeah. go in this really weird new direction, even long after Bray Wyatt got released. Yeah, I I heard that uh, Alexa actually is going to be stepping away from uh you know is either yeah he's she's actually you know stepping away from WWE for a little bit you know either taking time off or whatever but I don't know if that means that she's going to be coming back as you know what she was before you know brain the whole fun house weird stuff or what if there's going to be a possible repackaging of her gimmick somehow I don't really right. know yeah I don't either um I was going to say before I go to my other point that I was thinking of the other wrestler that I know is slated for repackaging is Elias because Elias has mm. finally gotten rid of his, you know, walk with Elias, you know. Yeah. And I'm yeah, curious to know, I'm curious what he's going to do with that. I, I mean, they can't just, I feel like you can't just do the old get a clean haircut, trim your beard up, and call it a repackage. Like, I feel like, yeah. you know, I feel like, I mean, that's obviously that's what they did with um, what's his face? Whoever the guy that he was uh, associated with for the longest. I'm blanking on his name, but I think it'll be interesting to see what they do with him. But what I was going from with Alexa is as far as wrestlers to potentially debut in AEW, I know there's a lot of talk. I've heard, at least it seems like there's rumors to suggest that why it might try and take Strowman and Eric Rowan, who I think goes by Eric Redbeard now, and then Bo Dallas and kind of recreate the old Wyatt family. Cause I think, you know, everyone that kind of left a strong impression on everyone. And I don't think anyone really wants it to disappear. Yeah. Like a Wyatt family 2.0, uh, just a, also again, another a shame about, you know, Luke Harper too. So uh, may he rest yeah. easy too. That, that was definitely a tough loss because I think it was interesting. You know, you didn't really think of like the impact he left on people like as like when he was like wrestling in the WWE. But like, you know, you heard the testimonies like everyone just said, like he was an all around great guy who just, you know, loved what he did, loved his family and everything. And it's just like, you know, really was like a very heart wrenching death to hear like in the wrestling community. Yeah, I was I was very shocked when I saw news. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I'm I'm like, when I saw oh Brody Lee, I'm like, oh Brody Lee from AEW. Then you know, putting a bolt here, like, oh my god. But still, uh, just of course, my you know, continuing my condolences to you know his fans and to the uh, dark yeah. order around AEW. 